Visualization isn't just pretty pictures. It's got the potential to revolutionize the way in which we use information. But that comes at a cost. There's a lot of data that needs to be moved around. So we've come to Shrewsbury to see Shoot Hill, and they're going to explain to us why using the cloud is an essential part of the future of visualization. So Rod, what do you do here at Shoot Hill? What we do at Shoot Hill is really three main things, I guess. The first one is we're involved in this area called data visualization. It's a big area, it's a confusing area, but really to me, visualization of data is making sense of data out there in the internet. The problem with the world at the moment is, isn't that there's too much, isn't that there's too little data, that there's too much data. And finding what you're looking for is a real problem. So that's the first thing that we are trying to, trying to address. Second thing we're involved in is mapping. Various ma mapping, different sorts of data sets that are out there. Uh, things like flood, crime, hospitals, schools, all that sort of stuff. And the third area, I guess, is what we call sort of future technologies. We're very interested in Microsoft technologies such as Silverlight, Deep Zoom, Microsoft Tag, and Pivot. And, uh, and these sort of these sort of technologies require some sort of you know cloud application. So those are the three things that we do at Shoot Hill. How did you get started in the business? Well, I've been in the business a long time, Tim been around a long time. Um, initially, I think the thing what really got me really was this, th these technologies were coming along and I was becoming aware of them, specifically things like mapping, Silverlight and these things. And I wanted to set a business up that we could really exploit the power of this new technology. So uh, are, are you a numbers geek? Uh, pff, not really. In fact, I'm probably the opposite. My, I've got a small problem in the, in the sense that when I look at reams and reams of numbers, they become a sort of a blur to me. So I want to make sense of those numbers really easily. So I'm not a numbers geek. I'm, I'm, I guess I'm the opposite. I'm trying to make sense of numbers and in a quick way, in an easy, understood way by people. So is there some kind of niche technology or is there a mainstream problem that needs to be fixed? I think it's a problem that everybody's got to solve. For example, I've been involved recently in trying to find information on council tax bans. And if you go on the internet and try to find different council tax bans for different parts of the country, there's only one website in the whole country where you can find that information. Now, it's not as if there's anybody's hiding this information at all. It's just that it's too confusing to make sense of it and find it. That's the problem. So being able to have a technology that can grip all this technology in one place, all this information in one place, that's the answer for the future. So it is really, it isn't, this is not niche. So with visualization and with mapping, you're moving a lot of data around. What sort of constraints does that mean you're under? Uh, good question. Uh, the first problem that we tend to have a lot of the time is time. I mean, we have a lot of the stuff that we do. We work for we work for media agencies, news agencies. They want things really instantly. So, for example, last year we were involved in the political expenses situation. This year we've been involved a little bit with the earthquakes in Japan. When these incidents happen, we have to move really fast. So the first one is time. Second one is finding that information that we need. We need to access that information, be able to get it fast, be able to visualize it quickly. So again, it's a combination of finding and time. And the third one is using a methodology that makes sense for the actual data itself. So for example, if we're showing you know, information around the royal wedding, when it's a big difference to that than showing something on the Japanese earthquake. So it's finding the right technology for the right data set. Tell me about the scale of the data you're moving here. Well, that's another reason why we've moved increasingly to the, to the cloud is because the enormous size of files that we're dealing with, and hopefully I'll show you later on some of our deep zoom work, we're talking terabytes of data. And if we create something like that on our own servers here, by the time we actually upload it to the, to the internet, <laughs> the incident's over because it takes so long. So being able to create these things on the cloud is a great benefit to us. It, it reduces that time, that time problem that we have. And as I say, the, the data sets are so vast, there's no other real way of doing it. So when did you make the decision to move to the cloud? I think the first time we actually really became aware of the necess necessity of it was when we first deployed something abroad. I mean, um, we were main, mainly UK centric and then we got started getting a few uh, jobs uh, abroad and uh, we want to make sure that we have you know maintain perfect data speed abroad so that was the first thing second thing what really started at the same time was these files that we're creating are getting bigger and bigger and bigger I mean you know some of the first deep zooms we did were in the order of a couple of hundred megabytes now as I say we're in terabytes so those two problems one delivery abroad two enormous size of the data was one of the first sort of drivers and that was around about oh I don't know uh, uh, June last year something like that June 2010 um, that's when we first moved. So for Shoot Hill, why is your and what's so special about Microsoft? Well, Microsoft's done a really good job here. Um, I, I heard the other day that they're actually setting up more servers per month 
than the whole of Facebook. So they've done a fantastic job in the, in the, in the size of, of, of project that they've undertaken. Secondly, we're a Microsoft house. We're used to dealing with them. We know what they can do. They're always reliable. We've always a fantastic service from them and we've got a very close relationship. Thirdly, um, I like the way they've done, they've sorted out billing and how easy it is to use. It isn't difficult to actually get going on this. Some of the other systems I looked at are quite complex as regards to, first of all, getting started, but then also billing and so on. So there's three main reasons why we chose Azure as the primary cloud solution that we use. Technically, are there good reasons to use Azure for you? Yes, performance again across the world. Um, we also work in an iframe environment a lot of the time where we're actually supplying our, our, um, our visualizations to other people to embed in their websites. So security is a real concern for those guys. So we have to make sure the security side is perfect. For people like, well, you know, some of the large news agencies out there, um, whereby you wouldn't know it was Shuto that's providing the information, but obviously if security was a problem, we would, um, we, we would have to be really aware of that. So security side of Azure is, is really, really, really tight. So that's important to us. A lot of people would say the visualization is just about pretty pictures, but you're solving more important problems here, aren't you? I couldn't agree with you more. There's no point doing a visualization on something that doesn't make any sense to anyone. And somebody was telling me the other day around government debt. And if you was to visualize government debt, I mean, what does that mean to people? Government debt, I mean, it's what, 100 billion trillion pounds or something? That doesn't mean anything to me and you, Tim. That's too much big money for us. But if you said that a government debt was, say, six foot by six foot by 12 foot long, how big is actually something like the Royal Navy? Somebody told me it was the size of a matchbox. And when you say that, when you say there's an enormous six foot square rectangle, uh, and then you say there's a matchbox, you have some idea of the difference between government debt and actually how much the Navy costs. So visualization is to make sense of something that is possibly boring, complicated, nobody's really interested in, but when you see something that's a really good job of that, you understand it immediately. Our, our mantra here is you've got to understand what we're doing in five to 10 seconds. That's about the time that people spend on websites. So if you don't get it in that time, you're just going to leave. You're just going to leave that page and you're going to be gone. OK, well, let's have a look at a few of the things that you do here. So here's a good example of what I mean by visualization, Tim. Here we've got uh, we were commissioned actually to build something that would commemorate the uh, Battle of Britain. And everybody knows about the Battle of Britain. They know what it was and so on. But we were asked to do something that was different from anything else that anybody else has seen before. So what we've done here is we've built a deep zoom uh, mosaic of the battle itself. And this is made up of lots and lots of pictures from the wartime and so on of what was going on during World War II. Fine, great. And that's really nice. And you put your mouse over a picture, up pops some metadata, and you know what that picture's about. But we also have some documents here. And these documents are original Luftwaffe scans, look, scans of Luftwaffe documents, uh, showing where target areas were in the country. So you're able to read the documents. You're able to look, zoom in on them, read them. But we've done more than that. We've added a mapping component to the actual deep zoom itself. So when I click view this maps, the, the maps for this particular document, I shift over to what we call time map. And here we have a time scope. We can move it around. And this particular map we're looking at is a, is a Luftwaffe target allocation map. And as, as you can see, we've overloaded, uh, overlaid it over the modern world. So we've got various different views here. One's, one, some of them are, are of just German maps. Others are... German aerial photography and I can zoom in and we can see exactly what that land was like years ago. So it's a way of bringing old data, in this case you know, old photographs and old maps alive for people in the modern world and uh, for me it was, it was almost, almost a, a day off to be able to build this kind of product because it's not only is it showing off you know things about the war but it's actually making history come alive. So on this particular example, we've got something like 180 different scans of maps, large scale scans of maps. We've got 200, uh, sorry, 500 pictures, most of them in excess of sort of 10,000 10, 10, pixels. So high quality imagery. Plus we have a, a, a various set of photo, photos, photo synths of different aircraft from the war. So there's an enormous amount of data here. I mean, you wouldn't know it when you just look at it, but there's a lot of data. And to deploy that on the cloud was so much easier. And do you have any applications that show us where this is going in the future? Here's something we did, Tim, on the United Nations. This one was for the UNHCR, and um, it was to, the idea of this particular microsite was to showcase the plight of refugees around the world. I had no idea, but there's 48 million refugees in the world, and we were trying to figure something out to make this come alive to people. So what we have here is a, a deep zoom, and I'm going to zoom in again, and I'm, this time I'm going to put it on full screen so you can see the sort of quality of the imagery that we're dealing with here. We have perfect images 
throughout this entire archive. These are taken by people in the field uh, from the UN, and these pictures are, as, as you can see, high, high quality definition pictures. So there's a lot of pictures in here, something like 2,000 pictures. That's just the first part that we've done. The second thing we've done in this, particular, in this particular exhibit is to actually highlight the problem of refugees. Again, this time we're using maps. Um, and now what I wanted to do is make that full screen. So now we have a map, a world map. But what is this actually showing us? This is showing us refugee camps around the world. When I click one of these, one of these camps, we get information about that particular camp, where it is, etc., etc. And we also have another bunch of sections over here where we can bring in different parts of what the UN is doing around the world. And when I zoom in, and again, we're using silverlight mapping here, which is instantaneously fast. We can zoom in on heat maps of refugee camps in that part of the world. And then the final little bit I just wanted to show you about this particular uh, exhibit is video. We have video component built into this demo. And uh, we have an example of somebody talking about the United Nations built into the actual demo itself. So, um, so, so here we have video built in it as well. And this is highlighting the problem. So, the main, the main reason why, though, we deployed on the cloud for this particular application is not only the size of the, of the apps, the size of the, of, the, of the imagery, but also that this had to work worldwide. I mean, it's a United Nations site, so it has to be working perfectly at perfect speed, Switzerland, New York, UK, uh, and the Congo. So by deploying on the cloud, we can guarantee performance around the world. Where do you think this is going in the future? What's the potential for this? The thing what's happened about the cloud is, I mean, 15 years ago, people were talking about ASP. People were talking about software as a service. People have been talking about delivery of systems over the cloud for a very long time. Now we're there. Now we can do it. Now it really is there. So that's, that's important to us that it is practical to do it. Second thing is what I really like is that in a normal ISP situation, hosting, you pay for hosting whether you use it or not. With the cloud solution, with Azure, you only pay for what you use. And there's three components to that. One is the actual bandwidth you're using, one is the computer space you're building, and one is the server space you're taking up. So it's really easy to know what you're actually paying for. That is very important to us because we deploy things all the time. And I guess the other thing that we, we, what's really important for us is that if we compute something in our own office here in Shrewsbury and we want to upload that to the internet, it could take us a month. I mean, it's that, these, these images are that, that large. So by computing actually on the cloud, we avoid all of those problems. So that's really important. The other thing, the final thing I'd like to say is I believe that the future, people will use visual medium to find information on the internet. No longer will people be using lists. That is something that I believe is going to end one day. You will find what you're looking for by searching for it visually, and that's going to require enormous computing speed, enormous computing space, and something like a cloud solution is the only way we're going to be able to do that. Mm -hmm.